One thing is certain about the Whitechapel murders. They alerted society at large to the horrendous social conditions that had been allowed to develop, relatively unchecked, beyond the eastern fringe of the world's wealthiest square mile, the City of London. However, it wasn't as if warnings about the large dispossessed underclass that dwelt in the East End had not been sounded. Indeed, social commentators had been raising concerns about the social problem for years prior to the onset of the Jack the Ripper murders. Charles Dickens and Henry Mayhew and his brother Augustus had, for example, reported extensively on the everyday lives of the poor at the East End of the Victorian metropolis. Philanthropists and social reformers had been warning of the dangers of allowing a vast underclass to wallow in misery, poverty and depravity in and around the streets of Whitechapel and Spitalfields for decades. Yet society at large had, on the whole, chosen to ignore their warnings, largely on account of the fact that few of the wealthier inhabitants of 19th century London would ever cross paths with their downtrodden compatriots. Jack the Ripper, with his series of gruesome murders, proved the ideal villain on whom to hang East End ills in general, and very soon into his reign of terror, those who had been lecturing on the necessity for change had succeeded in linking the Whitechapel murders to the sordid state of the East End in the eyes of society at large. In other words, Jack the Ripper had succeeded in doing what social reformers and agitators had been trying to do, and largely failing to do, for many years – make people take notice of the grinding poverty and horrific social conditions in the East End of London. This was a point that George Bernard Shaw was making in his letter to the Star newspaper, Blood Money to Whitechapel, published on the 24th of September, 1888, in which he commented, Sir, will you allow me to make a comment on the success of the Whitechapel murderer in calling attention for a moment to the social question? Private enterprise has succeeded where socialism failed. Whilst we conventional social democrats were wasting our time on education, agitation and organisation, some independent genius has taken the matter in hand and by simply murdering and disembowelling four women converted the proprietary press to an inept sort of communism. And it was the exposing of the horrendous social conditions that inspired one of the most memorable images of the Jack the Ripper saga, Punch's cartoon, The Nemesis of Neglect. In the immediate aftermath of the murder of Annie Chapman, which took place in Hanbury Street on the 8th of September, 1888, newspapers were almost tripping over themselves to decry the sordid conditions in the area that were being described in vivid detail at the inquest into her death, as well as at the other inquests into the deaths of Martha Tabram and Mary Nichols. Numerous opinion pieces were appearing in the daily papers that were effectively portraying Annie Chapman as a martyr to the social depravity of the East End of London, whilst at the same time also trying to find a moral to the Whitechapel murders in general. One such article appeared in the Morning Post on Wednesday the 12th of September. It read, There is an aspect of the Whitechapel tragedies which, though only of the nature of a sidelight, ought not to be disregarded. We may call it the domestic aspect. The veil has been drawn aside that covered up the hideous condition in which thousands, tens of thousands of our fellow creatures live in this boasted 19th century and in the very heart of the wealthiest, the healthiest, the most civilised city in the world. We have all known for many years that deplorable misery, gross crime and unspeakable vice, mixed and matted together, lie just off the main roads that lead through the industrial quarters of the metropolis. The daily sins, the nightly agonies, the hourly sorrows that haunt and poison and corrupt the ill-fated tenants and sojourners in these homes of degradation and disease have been again and again described with more or less truth and force by our popular writers. But it is when some crime of accident, more than usually horrible, has given vividness and reality to the previously unrealised picture that we are brought to feel what our keenest powers failed adequately to conceive before, how parts of our great capital are honeycombed with cells hidden from the light of day where men are brutalised, women are demonised, and children are brought into the world only to be inoculated with corruption, reared in terror, and trained in sin, till punishment and shame overtake them too, 
and thrust them down to the black depths where their parents lie already lost or dead to every hope or chance of moral recovery and social rescue. Dickens and the brothers Mayhew have told us how such as these live, sin, suffer and die. The clergy, painfully familiar with all of it, appeal for sympathy and help. Doctors know well the back scenes and sore sorrows of these squalid quarters and are united in their testimony to the shortcomings of society which make such revolting conditions of life possible. Here and there some well-born lady with money and time at her command forsakes for a few hours the refinements and amenities of her well-ordered home to do angel's work in these degraded regions of festering filth, crouching crime and moral blight. And what such gracious visitors tell us is that things could not be worse than they are. But they cannot go into details where the facts are so hideous and unmentionable. Then comes a terrible crime, bringing a revelation that fills every soul with horror and makes us ask why sleeps the thunder and how these things can be. The answer is in the facts disclosed. Take the latest as a sample of the rest. A wretched back street is crowded with houses of the most miserable class. Nearly all of them are let out in single lodgings of a single room or part of a room. The house where the murder was committed had no less than six families, all toilers for daily bread, some of questionable honesty or sobriety, and all, we may be sure, contaminated in greater or less degree by the vicious surroundings of their distressful home. Some work at the markets, some at the docks, one is a carman, another a cooper, some have no occupation. Loose women have as free run in these abodes as rabbits in a warren. There is a continual coming and going. Some go to work as early as one o'clock in the morning, others as late as four or five or six, so that the place is open all night and anyone can get in, sometimes men and women in pairs, sometimes singly. Precepts of decency are not observed, the standard of propriety is low, the whole moral atmosphere is pestilential. Poverty in its direst forms haunts some dwellings, ghastly prolificacy defiles others, and this in street after street, alley after alley, cul-de-sac after cul-de-sac, garret after garret, and cellar after cellar. Amidst such gross surroundings, who can be good? With this atrocious miasma continually brooding over them and settling down among them, who can rise to anything better? Morally, these people are not only lost, they are dead and buried. What ministering angels can make their dry bones live and quicken them to a purer and happier life? This is the part of the subject that clamours for immediate consideration. These are miseries that need immediate remedy. These are the lamentable conditions of human existence which may well tax the wisest counsels and the most philanthropic consideration of the best men and women of the day. Side by side with all the luxury, the ease, the magnificence and abounding plenty of a vast metropolis are all these pitiable ground-down people bowed with misery and steeped in crime. Happily there are here and there, like far-off stars in darkest nights, exceptional instances of honesty, virtue, truth and good human love, which to a small extent redeem the blackness of these moral wastes. It is not so much the truncheon of the policeman that is wanted as the wand, magical in its power and healing in its touch, of higher moral ministries. Some centres at intervals in their very midst where the gentle ministrations of Christian love shall never be sought by the weary and heavy laden in vain. Where the veriest outcasts may knock and feel that there at least there are pitying hearts and open hands, the instruments of God in the recovery of man. We take into the reckoning all that is being nobly done for the wretched people, but what we want to urge is that it is not half enough. The saddening sight of pent-up misery which the recent four murders disclose confirm our complaint that the better-off classes have not yet risen to the height of self-denial and charity which the hardness of the lot of these close-packed, hard-working, much-suffering poor require to enable them to break through the fetters that bind them down and gall their necks till they are fain to let things drift while they, like Lazarus in his grave, are without the wish or power to rise to anything better. 
We do not forget how much of the difficulty of helping these people lies in the badness of their homes, the want of space, of better sanitation and greater protection for the girls and children. We fear we must take it as a fixed condition of the problem before us that whatever is done requires time. To transmute the misery of our working poor into the plenteous comfort of fruitful industry requires the combination of many separate forces which can move successfully only within the area of economic laws, and these, of necessity, move but slowly. But the pressing question is how these forces may be best combined and set in motion, and in the meantime, how can the prompt and good offices of true benevolence intervene to help the evils that cannot wait? And thus the article drew to its stark and depressing conclusion, and the poor of the East End of London were left to fight their daily battle for survival, most of them no doubt oblivious to the points raised in the article, or even that it had been published. It is often said of the Jack the Ripper murders that they were a force for change, that these murders were a catalyst that led to an improvement in the social conditions in the East End. This is palpably untrue. The demolition of the slums was underway long before the murders began, but, as the article made clear, it was moving at a snail's pace. Poverty, degradation and misery continued to blight the lives of those who dwelt in the district until well into the 20th century. For us today, this article and the issues that it raised is very much a lesson from the past. For when modern politicians talk of the golden and glorious Victorian era and wax lyrical about reinstating Victorian values, it should never be forgotten that the hardships described in the Morning Post article were the reality of that age and those values for a large number of people. It should be remembered that within a few minutes' walk of the City of London, the vast wealth of which was powering an ever-expanding British Empire, huge numbers of people were living in grinding poverty and were fighting daily battles against the unimaginable hardships that were endemic to the area. As the Labour politician Will Crooks, who was born in the district in 1852, put it, how is it that the same sun which never set on the empire never rose on the dark alleys of East London? <laughs>